Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one and welcome to another episode of World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles and today's video is once again sponsored by Audible. You know the deal by now, you can start listening today with a free 30-day Audible trial and get full access to thousands and thousands of all you can listen audiobooks, original entertainment and podcasts included in the Plus catalogue. Just visit audible.com slash jingles or text jingles to 500, 500 on your mobile phone. And since you get a free audiobook credit every month with your Audible subscription, it's become traditional at this point for me to recommend something for you to use that free audiobook credit on. And this month I'm going to go with Leviathan Wakes, which is the first book in the Expanse series by James S.A. Corey, which is just the pen name used by Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham, who co-write the series of books together. And also served as executive producers on the Amazon Prime TV show of The Expanse, which is one of the best science fiction TV shows ever made, and which I just finished watching for the second time, and it gets better the more you watch it. And it's the reason why I'm recommending you get the audiobooks. Actually, there are a couple of reasons. Because you might be sitting there thinking, Jingles, I agree, The Expanse was amazing, but I've seen the TV show, so why do I need to bother with the books? Well, first, obviously, the books always go into greater detail. But also, and far more importantly, they ended the TV show halfway through the books. There's more to the story. So if you want to continue your Expanse fix, if you want to know what the Laconians are getting up to on the other side of the Ring Gate, what happened to the builders of the Proto-Molecule, and what happens to the crew of the Rosinante in the years that follow on from the end of the TV show, this is the only way you're going to find out. So I have absolutely no hesitation in recommending James S.A. Corey's Leviathan Wakes, the first audiobook in the Expanse series, which you can get by heading over to audible.com slash jingles, or just texting jingles to 500 500. And now, on with the show, where Siri 96 here in the German Tier 10 destroyer, the Z-52, has already run into slightly more trouble than he bargained for, but it's kind of critical that he contests this capture circle even though he is already under air attack and everybody knows he's here. Tier 10 battle, obviously, although there are some tier 8s and 9s. The good news is that the carrier is tier 8 and the Z-52's AA isn't terrible. Also, these airstrikes are doing minimal damage, which is nice, but again, it's not really the direct damage that the carrier does that's the biggest issue when you're in a destroyer, it's the fact that they're spotting you, although it's pretty obvious that he's here, he's just managed to torpedo somebody. And he should be safe from everything other than the aircraft carrier, as long as he stays on the other side of this island. And as long as nobody tries to push around and shoot him, or torpedo him. Like... the Yugamo? Really? Switching to the perspective of his division mate in the Goliath here, who I assume is the reason why the Yugamo is committing suicide. I mean, you do realise that the Z-52 has that long-range German Hydro, right? Yeah, okay. Well, your funeral. Also, as you can probably tell, and we're going to be seeing more of him later, Draken Diablo here is clearly a man of culture since he's running me as the captain of his Goliath. Anyway, let's go back to Siri. So, scratch one Yugamo, and first blood to Draken Diablo in the Goliath. And safe though he pretty much is in this position, Siri is suffering from the same issue that the Yugamo was suffering from, and he's not dumb enough to go out in front of all of his enemy ships in order to find out what the consequences will be of constantly being located by either the two radars on the enemy team or all of those long-range German hydros on the enemy team. And while he is safe from direct attack from anything other than the aircraft carrier on this side of the island, that does kind of work both ways. Because the enemy Shimakaze on the other side of the island managed to slip into the cap circle with slightly more than four seconds to go before Siri captured it. So they're basically now cock-blocking each other. They're all detected by his hydro, he's detected by their hydro, neither of them can shoot at each other, and neither of them can claim this cap unless somebody does something really stupid and gets themselves killed. Like, for example, the friendly Akazuki, who just tried to push into Cap Circle Alpha while it was being radared and covered by the enemy Baltimore. So, one kill per team scores more or less even, although Series team have managed to claim the central cap at Bravo. They're the only team that currently holds a Cap Circle, so in the absence of any further kills, they're the only team that actually have any points coming in. 
there are a lot more enemy ships on the other side of this island than there are friendly ships on this side of the island, however. And if they figure that out, and also locate their man pants, Siri and the rest of his division could be in an awful lot of trouble. Of course, that situation is completely reversed over on the other side of the map, on the west, at Cap Circle Alpha, where the Akazuki just died, where Siri's team completely outnumber the available enemy ships over there. And the sooner they figure that out, the sooner they'll be able to push and take Cap Circle Alpha. I mean, there are four enemy ships over there that we know of, and there are at least six friendlies. There were seven, but they did just lose the Akazuki. The Parsible's coming back. Siri stuck his neck out there in order to get some torpedoes away and managed to get back into cover right in the nick of time before the Parsible could spot him for any of those enemy ships. Misses with the dive bombs, which was useful because it would be not good to have your capture progress reset at this point. Enemy Pommen over there has put his man pants on and he's uh, flanking around as wide as he possibly can. It looks like those torpedoes are not going to hit anything. And I think it's largely thanks to the Pommen that the enemy team are probably starting to realise... Hang on a second. At best, there are four enemy ships on the other side of this island. What are we all waiting for? I mean, in an ideal world, that's what would be happening. But what's likely to happen is the Pommen simply gets himself sunk for his efforts and the rest of them continue to skulk behind the island, all kind of looking at each other and going, go on then, you first. We can but hope. Somebody has a direct line of sight, or did. He's lost sight of the Shimakaze. Yep, there he is. Oh, not good. Took a couple of hits. I mean, the Shimakaze doesn't have terrible guns by Japanese destroyer standards. Certainly not Japanese torpedo boat standards. But they do hit pretty hard. It would be real nice if they could kill that Shimakaze. Although, you'll note that the Shimakaze is no longer the one contesting the cap circle. And he did with that one single salvo before he managed to go undetected, land a hit on Siri and completely reset his capture progress. Meanwhile, on the other side of the map, the rest of the team have managed to flip Alpha and seem to be doing reasonably well against the enemy ships over there, although they're not really sinking many of them. But the team do now have two capture points and a 200-point lead over the enemy team. Again... The kills are even. Both ships have lost two teams. Both ships have lost two teams. <laughs> Let's try that again, shall we? <laughs> Both teams have lost two ships. That's better. God, you wouldn't believe I do this for a living, would you? <laughs> okay. Oh, great news. Uh, the Johan de Witt over in Alpha has managed to get a kill. Is that legal? I, d I didn't think Dutch cruisers and World of Warships were allowed to sink things. I'll have to check that one with the judges. But anyway, that's put the, uh, the team even further ahead on points. They have a very convincing 300-point lead now. Siri checking the channel on the other side of the island because it's been a while since anybody took a look. And sure enough, there was a Preussen lurking over there. Unfortunately, he did get hydroed again at more or less exactly that same moment. The good news, of course, is he didn't actually take any damage from the Preussen secondaries, or if he did, it was very minor damage. He managed to get some torpedoes away, but he has been forced out of the cap circle. They're basically giving this cap circle up now. And if you look at what's coming around the corner there, you can probably understand why, particularly if you look at the health bars of the two remaining ships over here. Yeah, they can't repel firepower of that magnitude. Although the friendly Utiloids managed to get another kill. So the enemy team are now down four ships. And it's really down to these enemy ships on this side of the map where they do hold the advantage to take their brave pills, put their man pants on, and start trying to win. Which, of course, is exactly why Siri has abandoned this cap circle. Because if he gets stuck behind that island and they all come around that corner, he's in all kinds of trouble. It's pretty much here where the enemy team do start to fight back. They've just sunk the Udaloi. And Siri and the rest of his division understand that from here on in, they're no longer containing and contesting. They are instead fighting a delaying action. And Siri has been spotted. And it's the Shimakaze. Okay, he needs to die right the hell now. Which Siri is entirely capable of doing, but he had to fire the guns. So now he's spotted by anything within gun range. So he drops his smokescreen directly between himself and anybody who had a line of fire. 
which allows him to go undetected. Now all he has to do is wait out the 20 second bloom on his guns and that should be doable within a second or two. He's not going to stay inside that smoke screen though because he's fighting a delaying action. He needs to spot targets for the other two ships in his division. Unfortunately, the cyclone is now starting to close in. The enemy team have flipped Charlie. And this is where things can get really, really dangerous. Because with visibility closing down to a maximum range of 8km, that does not leave you an awful lot of margin for error. Even on a ship with relatively good stealth like the Z-52, he's got the surface detection range down to 6.1km, which is pretty good. But that leaves a very narrow window of opportunity for spotting an enemy ship and changing course before you blunder into detection range and they spot you. And that's assuming they're not running their radar or their hydro. Siri got himself a brief taste of what was about to come when he laid eyes on the Rune's spotter plane. And if the Rune's spotter plane is seen at 7 kilometers, that means the German Hydro is probably not too far away either. And he's being lit up to hell and back there by the Pommens secondaries. This is definitely not good. Torpedoes away. Now he just has to try to outrun the Hydro. That is literally all he can do. His engine's taken a hit, and he clearly has the last stand skill because he's not stopping. And his damage control is ready to go, and yet he has managed to outrun both visual and hydro spotting. Although it looks like, once again, the torpedoes aren't actually going to hit anything. I would have probably been tempted to blow the damage control the instant my engine took a hit while I was spotted by hydro in a cyclone. But, well, it probably would have only saved him from taking a couple of hundred damage. He did manage to outrun the spotting very, very quickly without having to use it, so it's all good. What's not all good, if you have a look at the minimap, is how close that enemy Akazuki is getting to the Shikaku. I mean, he's inside visual detection range, which probably means the torpedoes are on the way if they haven't hit already, and he's showering that carrier with 100mm high explosive. And yeah, in fact, he has managed to sink him. And it should be relatively easy considering that there's a cyclone and maximum visibility is 8 kilometers, for him to escape, for him to slink back off into the fog. Which is really bad news, because the Schlieffen and the Goliath in Ceres Division have got themselves caught between that Akazuki, who will be reloading his torpedoes, and the rest of the enemy team coming around the side of that island. None of that is good news. Although what is good news is that, despite all of this, Series team are still a good 500 points ahead. Although they were a good 600 plus points ahead before they lost the Shikaku. In the Shikaku player's defence, he was at least doing better than most carrier players and reacting to the fact that basically the entirety of the remainder of the enemy team were all sweeping down on his position from the northeast. It was just unfortunate that his escape route drove him straight into the Akazuki. It's almost as if the Akazuki prepared it that way. So what's that Akazuki doing? Well, if he has any sense, he's going to be flipping Alpha because his team are still 600 points behind. And they're 600 points behind because Ciri's team do still hold two of the caps. The enemy team have a choice between Capture Point Alpha and Capture Point Bravo, and most of the rest of Ciri's team are currently loitering around in Capture Point Bravo. So in order to flip Bravo, the enemy team are basically going to have to kill everybody. Now, I'm not going to say that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's going to be hard, and it's going to be unlikely. Alpha is a far, far more easy opportunity because of the Akazuki. In fact, I'm honestly surprised we haven't seen him in there already. Although his torpedoes have almost certainly reloaded by now. So he's probably looking for a kill first. But if there's anybody on the enemy team capable of thinking and breathing at the same time, they're going to be yelling at that Akazuki to go and flip Alpha. Because that is absolutely where the Akazuki can do the most good. He can flip Alpha and be in a position to fire torpedoes down narrow channels where the majority of the rest of Ciri's team are all clustered together. The fact that he has not yet already started to do that, well, doesn't look like he needs to. The rest of Ciri's team are getting absolutely slaughtered in there anyway. I did say it wasn't impossible that the enemy team... <laughs> weren't going to just kill everybody. But the fact that the Akazuki has not yet started flipping Alpha tells me that that Schlieffen is probably about to get torpedoed by something. Oh, and the last other allied ship has gone down. Ceres Division, the Schlieffen, the Goliath, and him here in the Z-52 are the only three friendly ships surviving. They still have a 300-point lead. 
and they've extended that lead. The Schlieffen's managed to get a kill with his secondaries. I'm just astonished that he hasn't been torpedoed yet. Honestly, I have no idea what that Akazuki is doing. I mean, he's probably running from the Goliath, but why not run north through that cap circle at Alpha, which is wide open? Perhaps he's in shock, because he did sink a carrier, and destroyers aren't supposed to be able to do that. Oh, more bad news. The Schlieffen was trying to fight the corner and stem the enemy advance. Went down to the Pommens Torpedoes. And the enemy team are now flipping Bravo. Alpha is still wide open. I still have no idea what the Akazuki's doing that's better than flipping Alpha, considering they are still 300 points behind. But Siri attempting to buy them some time by flipping Charlie once again. The problem... I mean, he's probably going to flip the cap, but how long he's going to hold on to it is anybody's guess. He's got some torpedoes away against the rune, but, well, it's a rune, and it has excellent hydro. And he's probably aware that somebody's just flipped this cap, so he's going to be running the hydro. If any of those torpedoes hit, it will be a minor miracle. He's almost certainly seen them. He's going to thread the needle right between the torpedo tracks, and almost certainly get away scot-free. The rune obviously knows that there's somebody here now, and with just over 6,000 health left, there's no way Siri is going to loiter around here, waiting to try to defend the cap against that rune, and get picked up by the rune's hydro. At the same time though, somebody, it must be the Akazuki, is finally flipping Alpha. The rune is about to contest and decap Charlie, and with the amount of time remaining, they need to sink some more enemy ships in order to win. Now this looks like it may have been a mistake, but he may have done this deliberately, because he did drift to just within hydro range of the rune and got himself detected. So why is he popping his smoke? That's not going to stop you from being hydro Well, he immediately motored out of hydro range, and because the rune shot at him, he can see the rune through the smoke, and the rune can't see him, and it did make the rune turn to get all of its guns to bear, which very nearly resulted in the rune running into all of those torpedoes. Unfortunately, it just wasn't quite enough. Although he was able to keep shooting at the rune without being spotted and has set a fire, unfortunately, with the amount of health that the rune has remaining because none of those torpedoes hit, the fire alone is not going to be enough to sink him. If he'd scored a torpedo hit, and if those torpedoes had caused a flood, and if the rune had blown his damage control, that fire may have been enough to do it. But as it is, it's just not enough. The good news here is that the Cyclone is lifting. That's the only real bit of good news for Siri, because that cap is being flipped, the enemy team have taken control of the other two caps. The Cyclone lifting is good news for him, because he's in a destroyer with 6.1 kilometers stealth, and they are not. So he can now actually start to use that stealth advantage. Drake Diablo over there in the Goliath was actually able to spot the Akazuki when he was in the process of flipping Alpha. Not because he charged into the cap circle in an effort to find and sink him, he'd already realised at this point that his job was to stay alive, but because the Akazuki couldn't resist taking a couple of shots at him in an effort to try to score himself another kill while he was still in the process of flipping the cap. With two minutes left and in possession of all three of the caps, the enemy team can easily make up the 200 points that they need in order to win. In fact, they can probably do it even without killing him. Which means somebody, whether it's Drake in the Goliath, or Siri in the Z-52, needs to get another kill. And here comes the Salem. Which is what prompts Siri to basically go all in and get himself into a gunfight with a Salem when he's on 6,000 health. What's remarkable here isn't that the torpedoes that he launched against the rune earlier have actually managed to hit and do some damage without sinking anybody, but that he actually wins the gunfight <laughs> against a cruiser with the fastest reloading 8-inch guns in the game. He didn't get away scot-free, of course. He now has precisely 393 more health than he needs. <laughs> If anybody so much as farts in his general direction now, he's going to die. But from here on in, with the clock running down, they might just be able to make it, as long as both Siri and the Goliath stay alive. 
So both Siri in the Z52 and Drake Diablo in the Goliath are now making Billy big steps towards their respective map borders. Unfortunately, Drake Diablo in the Goliath is running out of ocean to run to. He's surfing that map border with a Kremlin chasing him. Or at least he can see a Kremlin chasing him. There may be more ships. He's realized he's not gonna get away with this. He's about to get spotted. But maybe, just maybe he can take the Kremlin with him. He's already got the torpedoes away. He's spotted. He's losing absolutely nothing from firing. And if the Kremlin doesn't get him, the Akazuki will. At more or less exactly the same time at the other end of the map, the rune is coming back, looking for revenge and another kill. Siri launches some torpedoes, turns around, motors the hell on out of there, praying that the rune doesn't have any charges of hydro left. Meanwhile, back on the map border, the Kremlin nails Draken Diablo with 11 seconds to go, putting the enemy team 50 points ahead. Even if he had full health, and he doesn't, there just isn't enough time left for Siri to win a gunfight with the rune, and the rune turns away because he knows he doesn't need to find and kill Siri. But he turns straight into the path of the torpedoes, and he eats the second torpedo with zero seconds left on the clock, which is just enough to put them 20 points ahead and snatch victory from the literal jaws of defeat. What I loved most about this battle was it wasn't really a throw. Pretty much everybody was doing what they needed to do in order to win. Well, not everybody, obviously. The Yugamo at the beginning did kind of throw, but, well, nobody throws a match in the first three minutes. You know what I mean. No, there was no point during the course of this battle that you could point to one single incident and say, yep, that's where they threw this match. It literally went right down to the wire which is really rare in World of Warships. In fact, it's quite rare in most online multiplayer games where the outcome is usually decided not by who plays the best, but by who makes the least mistakes and capitalizes most on the mistakes that the enemy team have made. So that was a hugely entertaining game to watch. And I hope you all agreed because that is pretty much it for today. As always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.